Well, thanks very much, Tom. That's, that's a terrific introduction. It's good to be reminded. I've forgotten half the things that you mentioned. But <laughs> uh, it's, um, so today, uh, you know, sort of uh, biology is, uh, uh, is a lot of uh, inspiration, but also a lot of um, uh, hard work and bookkeeping, I would say, keeping track of things. I think biologists sometimes don't do enough of that, and um, in, in, the, in, uh, in, in the more dynamical, quantitative ways. But, and out of this kind of bookkeeping of information, often emerges some insights that, uh, you know, where the actual process itself may not be so glorious, but the uh, return is, is, is certainly of interest. And so, um, so today I'm going to really talk about sort of uh, uh, modern high-level bookkeep bookkeeping in biology. It's, um, uh, it's got other names that uh, sound better, like uh, proteomics and transcriptomics. <laughs> but uh, we know what it is. And, uh, and then I think um, often it's looking for uh, uh, specific um, information that you already have in mind, which is a very reasonable thing to do, you know, whether something's present or not. Uh, but I'm going to be even more simple-minded in this talk and just talk about what we find in general and more globally. Um, now, uh, also, uh, so it's really about embryos, uh, and particularly about frog embryos. Uh, Frog embryos, uh, you know, if you went back many, many, many years ago, would be a common system to be used in embryology. Um, why would you any, use any other system? I mean, after all, uh, the development happens right there in a dish, pure distilled water. Well, the frog will develop, um, easy to see and visualize. You can manipulate the animal surgically. Um, then. Uh, as time passed, uh, people said, well, you know, it's kind of awkward that there's no genetics. It's kind of awkward that you can't see through the thing clearly. Um, so it's, it's got a special role. But, uh, but I think in the area of proteomics, uh, it, it has so much material in it, that, uh, and even single embryos and transcriptomics even, that you can actually analyze uh, uh, the, the, low, the levels of proteins, protein modification even, uh, which has really not been studied in a general sense in, in developmental biology. So I think the frog uh, still has a little life left in it, and I hope I can convince you that we can learn some things from that. Okay, so I want to look at, and even some of our assumptions about RNA and protein development. I think this title would have sounded kind of avant-garde in about 1980. I mean, not 1950, 1950. Um, but uh, after all, the people weren't thinking about RNA and protein. Here it sounds completely uh, insipid. I mean, what does it mean, RNA and protein? So I'll tell you about it in a global sense of just keeping track of RNA and protein and what we've learned, some of the things that we learned. Let's see. That's not moving. Why is it not moving? Little, well, I can just move it. Okay, so, so transcriptomics and proteomics is the fancy name for bookkeeping these days. And, it, and, uh, and one of the questions, um, a fairly important question, is um, uh, what does RNA expression tell us about protein expression in the embryo? In many cases, most cases, we cannot measure protein expression. Or, uh, and also, um, although in theory antibodies can be used for looking at protein localization, they're very hard to come by, where RNA is uh, much, much uh, um, more accessible, and we can measure it even in uh, embryos like uh, mammalian embryos and soft embryos are very small embryos. We can actually get some idea of RNA expression. Uh, so there's an implicit, um, uh, expectation that RNA is telling us something about protein, not unreasonable, but there's a certain uneasiness among the people who study RNA expression. What if it were true that uh, RNA wasn't telling us 
everything we want to know about protein, then we would be in trouble. And so um, there are a lot of papers appearing lately, as now that there are people making correlations between RNA and protein, and they're full of a kind of worry and dread. That is, you know, the correlations, the, uh, I've sort of, the average of all these correlations is about 0.4. Uh, you see people with 0.2 and 0.25 and people maybe point up to 0.6 but and, uh, and then comes all the explanation about how we're going to make sense out of a system where we can only measure RNA levels. So I think this is a good place to ask what does RNA expression tell us about protein expression. I never understood why RNA expression should ever correlate with protein expression. After all, uh, I mean it could under special circumstances but after all RNA in a simple minded sense Tell, we should tell us something about the rate of protein synthesis, not the level of the protein in the cell. Uh, so I never worried about these things, but you can find all sorts of papers and review articles worrying about the accumulating data of the discrepancy between RNA and protein expression. And <clears throat> then um, the other new feature in the last several years, major improvements, um, has been the idea of looking at RNA expression more globally, not just by in situ hybridization, but by looking at a whole transcriptome at the level of a single cell. And, uh, and I think this is really powerful technique. Uh, I want to tell you about some of the, we've been involved in some of those developments, some major developments in the last uh, year or two. And um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we can learn about uh, RNA expression uh, in single cells of embryos, and, and uh, at least to get a flavor of what the future might look like. Okay, so this is the, the question of the Xenopus egg developing into uh, a uh, early stage embryo. And um, what we've done here in the experiment is we have measured the RNA level and protein level at about 15 different points along development of a period of time that takes, but it's spaced not uniformly because we're looking at lots of things that are happening quickly at the beginning and more slowly later on, but, um, but uh, uh, over a period of about um, two days worth of development. And we're looking uh, for every, uh, uh, every a gene product that we can find we're look, uh, by proteomics, we're also looking at the RNA level. We, of course, have many more RNA expression patterns than we do have protein expression patterns. Um, so let me just sort of talk about what we... Um, and uh, I have to maybe, uh, for some people, at least explain the new developments, relatively new developments uh, that allow us to do quantitative multiplex proteomics. Um, and so here, uh, and this is basically how we are doing our proteomics, where we're taking 10 time points and, uh, we, uh, and we're going to mix them all together and examine them in a spectrometer on a single run. And, um, and the, uh, the way that's done is to react lysine groups for each sample with a tag which has the same mass in all of these samples. So in the MS1 spectrum, I'm going to show this the next, I'll come back in the, okay, it's not there. Okay, so in the first spectrum that you get, for every, for every peptide there'd be a single peak. Now, you can deconvolute that single peak into the individual samples by the fact that this tag, this TMT tag, uh, is made, is itself uh, a chimeric. There's two pieces to it. The mass adds up to the same mass, but the two pieces have different masses by, the, by having synthesized them with C13 and 15 um, uh, uh, mass uh, different uh, isotopes. So when you put it in the spectrophotometer and it, that first piece breaks off from the, um, from the, uh, the, uh, the peptide or the fragment of the peptide 
and it, uh, it can then be registered at a different place in the mass spectrum. So here you can see these, these labels here uh, have a label 126, 127. They're labels which, um, which are different masses. And as I say, they're combined in this, uh, in this tag with something with the complementary mass, so they all add up to the same one. So in the first peak, you get a single peak, but then when you fragment it, you get these little fragments that have different mass, and you can then determine from that exactly uh, how much of each sample you had in the sample. I don't know if I made that clear enough, but um, if you would tag them each with different masses, you would have 10 peaks in the mass spectrometer. And that would be just fine, except that the mass spectrometer would be very inefficient. It, 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 if, it, if you increase tenfold the number of peaks, it couldn't handle that large number of peaks. So you'd end up having a much uh, um, uh, shallower um, uh, inventory of proteins. So by combining them into a single peak and looking at them and then fragmenting them separately and getting off these little fragments of different ma mass, uh, you can get a much deeper m measurement. So that's what we used here to, um, to, uh, to essentially um, measure the, the, the abundance of proteins. We get the peptides and we can then identify the proteins. So, um, so we don't get all the transcriptomic products. Of course, maybe some of the transcriptomic products are not actually being translated, so that may explain one explanation. But the other explanation is that when you look at, these, at the abundance of these things, uh, that we're getting down into the, in this case, down into the tens of nanomolar ranges. So there are other proteins in the cell that are present at lower abundance, uh, and they're the ones sometimes people are most interested in, transcription factors, uh, receptors, uh, secreted ligands, so there's a, there's a lot, lot of long way to go in proteomics to get down into a real inventory of all those factors. Um, we found, uh, interestingly enough, uh, proteins that, in the cell for which there was no RNA. And uh, we can explain that uh, because the frog egg uh, picks up proteins from the mother. Uh, the yolk protein is made in the liver and is transported to the yolk. It turns out there are about 207 such proteins, it wasn't known that, but, uh, uh, but that are then transported from the mother into the, into the uh, so that, that exp explains that. Um, and uh, we had done a deep proteomics of the egg, which we couldn't quite afford at this run, at this point, uh, but where we had identified a, uh, a, a, a over uh, about 11,000 proteins, which is, which is I think the record actually for um, analysis of a single sample like that. But um, it, but we uh, we were using this uh, quantitative multiplexing method. We only are looking at 6,302 proteins. So. That's the, the level, that's the number of proteins we're actually looking at. It's quite a large number, but it's not what we would like. We'd certainly like ultimately to, I think we could probably uh, almost double that number today. I mean, it, it's happening so fast. Okay, so the first question is, um, uh, is um, how um, uh, close does, do our measurements uh, compare to previous measurements that people made. And um, it really compares very, very close. The, um, so I'm using as a, a, a measure of uh, coincidence here, the cosine distance. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that, but just can imagine, most of you are or aren't. But just imagine that uh, these are vectors because these are time points are in an n-dimensional space. So these are vectors where uh, each time point is a dimension. And uh, there's a, a line you can draw in with the, the, uh, through those points. And uh, there's the line that was measured before for uh, n. You could, and uh, then there's the line that we measure. And you can take the cosine distance. So if the cosine distance were 0, um, then uh, they would be superimposable. And if the cosine distance 
is you know one. They're just uh, completely random with each other, and the results turn out to be that um, if we look at uh, how the, our RNA measurements measure compared to uh, other measurements that have been done, the um, you know it's 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 very very good. Here's some specific examples of some. This is this would be a poor example. I mean, these were chosen to represent this thing. So the, this uh, sort of bluish thing, whatever purplish thing is, uh, is would be a very good example. This is a poor example, and the cosine distances are very close to zero. And for protein here, again, uh, they're also extremely pro where they've been measured by by other methods. They're almost identical to zero. So we think these measurements are good measurements. Um, so am I? Uh, I think it isn't working, but um, so what do we find in the terms of protein changes in development? Uh, well, we find that so the, here are, are various. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, clustered these into different patterns, and um, so we don't have to look at all 6,300 at once. And the thickness of the line represents the number of um, of um, of uh, proteins in that, in that uh, uh, cluster. So most proteins don't change at all in abundance all the way through uh, advanced embryonic stages. And uh, then, of course, we see other kinds of changes. And um, we can ask something about um, the how dynamic these proteins are. This gives you a sort of another measure of that. You can see most proteins are not very dynamic, and this is a, a measure of how dynamic they are. And um, it's, there's a big, uh, big class of proteins which are changing very little, and smaller classes that are changing more. And here you can see some specific examples of classes that are changing, ones that aren't changing. So um, here's then the question that you know people want to know: What in, is the correlation between mRNA level and protein level in development? And um, it is generally a very poor correlation between RNA and protein. Um, so here are just some examples of uh, of the kinds of patterns we see. We occasionally see things that are pretty correlated, but we often see things that look like that. And um, since, again, there are many too, too many to look at, we have to sort of, um, and we can see here, what is the, so the median correlation is almost zero. Oops, this is working? No, it's not. Okay, the median correlation is almost zero. Um, so that means that there are a lot of things that are anti-correlated and lots of things that are positively correlated and, um, and it's kind of uh, discouraging <laughs> if you want to use uh, RNA as a measure of protein, RNA abundance as a measure of protein. This is one of the worst examples. I mean, nobody's done it in development before. If you do it in cultured cells, they say it's 0.3 to 0.5, but okay. So, um, but people, so should this be a problem? So I want to examine this a little more closely and see what, where the problem is and, uh, uh, and what, you know, what possible explanations we have for this. So, as I said, the, the most abundant, um, uh, these are the various clusters of proteins, and this is also, we've clustered RNA here, and these are the various clusters, and these are the abundance in these various clusters. So, as you'll see here, although protein is constant throughout development in many, many, for many, many pro proteins. Uh, we don't find any, there are no clusters here where RNA is, is constant throughout development. And the most common cluster for RNA is this one. Uh, so it's already uh, asks for some sort of explanation. Now, to understand this better, we can look at, as I say, we, we have here the most common protein cluster, and I have the protein clusters over here, and the RNA clusters over here, and so you can see the most 
uh, common protein, the most common RNA cluster for the most common protein cluster is this one here. Here's an example of, of such, a, such an example. Now we could take a, a different one, just to, again, just to give you a flavor for this thing. Uh, so here's a protein cluster that goes up like this, and you can see that, um, that, that this, uh, that uh, the RNA cluster here corresponds to, uh, I mean, the protein, the, sorry, if you look at this protein cluster here, there are two of the RNA clusters that correspond to them. And here are the two RNA clusters that uh, mostly explain these, these protein clusters. They themselves don't look very much alike. So it's, it's, it's kind of a confusing story so far. Sorry for that. And uh, here's another one where, uh, in fact, there's only, there seems to be a, a single RNA and protein cluster that of course correlate with each other. And they, they do sort of correlate with each other. I mean, there, there's uh, the, and that one at least. That, that, this one looks like um, what you might hope to see. But in fact, it's quite a minority, as you can see, in that, in that data. So uh, the question is, what should we do? There's, I mean, at this point, you, uh, you want to sit down and write a paper. And uh, the first thing you have to do is figure out a title. And things, uh, uh, you know, and so you come, all sorts of titles come up uh, to mind, like, um, despite great hopes, the results are discouraging. How's that for a title? <laughs> uh, so uh, the best thing to do when, that, when you're when confronted with such data, not that the data, I mean, we are absolutely convinced that this is the best data ever obtained like this for any developmental system. Uh, we've been very, very careful in our analysis. Um, uh, it's even worse than that. It's not just like we can do better next time. So, um, so what can we say? Is there a way to rationalize this apparent discrepancy between RNA and protein? Now, I gave you a hint of that at the, when I opened the, the, my talk by saying, I don't know why people think these things should be correlated in the first place. But I didn't mean to say that correlation is a specific mathematical um, operation, but, um, but a functional relationship is different than a correlation. And so, uh, uh, although you could, you could manipulate one, one into the other in some sense. So let's imagine that it's the simplest of all possible models and see how well we can do with understanding the relationship between RNA and protein. And that will have some advantage if it works, if it really works powerfully, it will allow us to do something which many of us would like to do, even in the frog system where we have proteomics, which would be, in fact, to take the RNA data, which is much simpler to obtain, and convert it into proteomic data. OK, so here's the simplest of all possible models. I, that's the simplest. We just assume that uh, this is the rate of protein synthesis. And we assume that it's related to uh, the level of RNA. It's proportional to the level of RNA, which changes the function of time. And then we also assume there's a rate of protein degradation, which is just then uh, multiplied by rate constant, which is multiplied by uh, a function of protein as a function of time. So P, um, the P of T is the amount of protein per embryo. Ks is the translation rate for protein at time t, and R of, of t is the amount of RNA from the transcript encoding that protein, and Kd is the decay rate of that protein. I don't think I can think of anything simpler to you know, assume. Now, uh, so we would like to obtain these synthesis rates and degradation rates by fitting mass action connection, kinetics into the data and also assuming that, um, that the uh, the P of T equals zero is equal to the P of zero. So P of zero would be the amount of protein that we find in the egg, which we can measure. And so, uh, so we're, we're going to minimize this function, and we're going to extract from this minimization Ks and Kd. Now, the important thing that we're doing, which is really an assumption here, 
uh, is we're going to assume that there is a KS, which is the rate of protein synthesis per, per mRNA molecule per hour or per second or whatever it is. We're going to assume that that is true for all RNAs. And we're going to assume the KD is also true for all, all proteins. Otherwise, um, we would be fitting these things with the same data that we're using to try to explain it. Instead, we're going to use only one S and one KD, which we retain, retain from the entire collection of data in the whole. So this is not a, this is not a, um, a trick. This is, I mean, this is not a, a, you know, just a, a fitting thing. We're going to get KS and KD looking at all the proteomic data and all the transcriptomic data. Then we're going to put that in and see if we can predict uh, the relationship between RNA and protein. Now, there are two major assumptions here. There's no dilution, as the volume of the embryo remains roughly the same. And the protein synthesis KS and the protein embryo KD are constant throughout the observation period. Again, they may not be true, but that's probably the best we can do. Um, okay, how, how, do, how, does, how do we do this? How does it work? So here um, is the concentration of, of either protein or RNA. So this is RNA in blue and protein in green, and this is developmental time, and these are real data points. The RNA, I haven't shown to, uh, points on that curve, but it's the data we obtained by, by um, RNA-seq. And the green dots are the data obtained by mass spectrometry, and this is a real example. And so what we, we can do is we can now vary synthesis rate and, um, and half-life, or, or which is related to KD, and see if we can fit this protein curve. And um, so, that's the, uh, so that's what I want to do here. And you can see as I move these separately, if I move now the, the you know, the half-life and the, but I can find a point where uh, I can get a good fit. And, uh, and that's how I'm going to calculate the, the KS and the KD. And, you know, I, can, I don't have to move them separately. I can move them together. If you can see the, what's going up here on the top, we're just moving it around. And you can find a point, a unique point where these, uh, you get the best possible fit. And here's an example, that same example, that uh, in this case, the KD, the best fit is obtained when the KD is equal to zero, and KS lies between 212 and 218 moles of protein per mole of RNA per hour. And that's, uh, so that's what we did. And then we did that for every protein in, uh, measurement that we had, and where we always, you know, always had RNA measurements unless it was from that, uh, the examples where the, there was no RNA, of course, which is a few cases. And, we, uh, and this is what the data looks like, and, and there's a median we can calculate, and it varies, obviously, around the median, which could be errors in measurement, it could be real. Um, this is some data that was obtained by uh, mass spectrometry low, uh, in mammalian cells, so it's not in frog embryos. Um, and it's, it's uh, the data looks, I think our data looks a little better than that data, but they're similar looking data. We calculate 40 moles per mole per RNA of a, uh, RNA per hour for the median, or the mean rather, and uh, this is 140, but this is done in mammalian cells at 37 degrees, and this is done in frog eggs at 20 degrees, so it probably, probably easily explain that difference in the, in the rate per, in the rate of protein synthesis. So then, the question is, uh, using the the KSs and KDs, just assuming they're all the same, uh, for uh, does this help in improving the uh, interpretability of the data of the RNA data and the protein data in this whole in the embryo? And so it's really quite remarkable, actually, because here is remember the old. Pearson correlations where the mean was about 0.1. And now after looking at it this way, it, uh, the, uh, the, the improvement is, is extraordinary. I forgot what the actual number is, but, it, but there are clearly a few things, um, quite a few things out here where the Pearson correlation is one, and just a, a trail of things where the correlations are, are poor. 
So um, that simple model allows us to, uh, first of all, it allows us to do something, at least to relieve ourselves that somehow there's some uh, dark force at work here, and which is making the RNA and protein just not related to each other. In fact, the simplest model relates most RNA and protein in a way that uh, we should relax about that. Um, I mean, it also, we, we can look at the discrepant examples, and they may be particularly interesting, and I don't think we've gone enough thoroughly about it. How about things that are anti-correlated or poorly correlated by this model? Is there something, some translational activity, something else going on? We want to, is there something we're really interested in? I think it, would, it points us to those, but for the ones that it's fully explained, I don't think we have to worry about it. And finally, since it explains things so well, um, we can at least provisionally look at RNA uh, uh, curves of, of abundance versus time and convert them to protein curves of, of, per time. So, you know, re realizing, of course, that for any one example, that's taking a risk, but uh, it, at least uh, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. All right, so that's all I want to say about that. Um, Finally, we can make some estimates as how proteins change generally, and this itself was a bit of a surprise. Um, so, you know, going out to stage 33, the embryo has now had, uh, developed most of its organs, and you know, it's uh, it's uh, about to hatch. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's still more development to take place, but uh, you know, about. Um, two-thirds of the protein in the embryo at that stage is still the protein that was in the egg. Now that, nobody, I think, thought that was going to be true. We certainly didn't. Uh, and, uh, and so there's, there's definitely new zygotic products being made, but it, the maternal deposit is continually important uh, throughout the rest of, of, of through, uh, through very late stages of development. So, okay, so that's, that's what we can say about that. So, um, so even though the temporal patterns of uh, RNA and protein in abundance are virtually, zero, on average, uh, show no correlation, a simple kinetic model explains protein expression as a function of RNA levels, and maternal protein constitutes the dominant component in even in highly differentiated tissues, which, which most of the embryo is. Now, at this point, I just want, thought I would um, push on with RNA expression with, uh, and ask about single cell transcriptomics. So, uh, in the last couple of years, um, uh, Alain Klein, who was a postdoc at the lab, is now a faculty member at, um, at, at Harvard. Um, and working together, we, we uh, developed a single cell transcriptomic method, which has now, I think, been um, used in by quite a number of people, and um, it allowed us to go from uh, relatively small numbers of cells, rather inaccurate measurements, as I will tell you, to large numbers of cells. I think we've, we've, we've looked at 100,000 cells at the single cell transcriptomic level. The limit here becomes economic, you know, how much it costs to sequence all that stuff. Um, uh, and the data I'm going to show you uh, uh, in Xenopus, which has been the newest, my motivation for doing all this in the first place and for inducing, um, for Alain to be uh, uh, also uh, induced to do this whole thing, was really to study early embryonic patterning of the type we're looking at, at to ask not just what happens in the bulk embryo, which is actually not all that useful, uh, the good thing about the bulk measurements are that the RNA patterns are not that complicated. They're not, they, they, uh, they uh, usually appear in only one place. They don't, uh, until much later, appear in other places. So you can sort of make some sense out of expression in the bulk embryo and then with other data like in situ hybridization to sort of understand what that means. In other words, the protein is only coming up in one place then the changes in protein levels are probably uh, that you can measure uh, grossly in, in, the, in the whole bulk when you reflect localized expression. But ideally, we wanted to get down to the single cell level. 
and the existing methods didn't seem to be practical to, uh, to uh, expand to that level. And, but the goal here for, for, for us initially, although the experiments that we published initially were done on uh, human ES, um, ES cells, um, uh, because it was easier to use than, fro than frog blastomers, but frog embryo embryonic cells. Uh, eventually, we wanted to get to the frog embryonic cells, and we have gotten to that, so I really want to talk about that data. But let's want to talk about the method a little bit, because, so I guess our motivation was that um, we wanted to um, uh, sort of understand how um, what, what kind of control there was over differentiation, what types of cell types there were, what kind of cell states there were. And even though one should say we should be looking at protein or protein modification or even meta 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 metabolites or, or lipids or anything like that, the only practical thing you could hope to get at this point, and which is itself quite interesting, was the RNA expression. So getting, getting this over time in embryos, uh, we hoped would allow us to understand uh, some of the differentiation decisions that are occurring. So single cell uh, data, this is kind of existing kind of methodology. At the time is noisy, it requires effort and expense to, uh, to do it at large scale. And, uh, and this kind of plot we'll see later, which, you know, uh, where things should be, uh, if they were just r random variation by Poisson input variation, uh, would look, as I'll show you, quite different from this. So this is kind of uh, not, a, not bad data for its time, uh, but, you know, publishable in Nature Methods, but still um, we wanted to be able to do that. We wanted to be able to do that at hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of cells. So there are two methods that uh, were published back-to-back uh, -back in cell uh, last year, and they were um, uh, one from Steve McCarroll and Aviva Gav, and the other from uh, our lab. Um, and uh, there, there are a lot, a lot of similarities between these two methods, and uh, there's some differences. Um, uh, and I think some of the, uh, depends on what the features are, whether really that makes a difference or not. So, but I just want to point out both of these methods. These methods, you know, really, uh, you know, changed the, the uh, state of single cell transcriptomics. They're a very different methodology. There's a whole different set of, of, of techniques. And the details, I say, are different. And, uh, you know, you, if people are more interested, I can tell you more about what the differences are, but the similarities are probably more important than the differences. So in both, in, and I'll just talk about our method, but as I say, it's, it's also, some of this is very similar. So the idea is to encapsulate single cells in drops of water, drops of aqueous solution, in oil. Now, you can make these drops in oil, it's been done for a long time, and they can be stable for years. So this is, you know, a way of, of making little containers. Uh, you could imagine putting cells into, you know, 384 well plates, or you could put them into drops of oil, and this is actually more efficient in many ways. Um, and um, with the cells, we put in a, uh, a bead, and the bead contains primers, and the primers uh, will prime RNA from the poly, uh, from the poly A tail. And um, there are a few features of these primers. Each bead uh, contains um, a, a, uh, all the primers have in it an encoded barcode. Uh, and um, they're also photocleavable. So when the bead is put in here, and then we flash light on it, the primers come off, and uh, they, they trans, um, uh, transcribe the um, uh, RNA into DNA, I mean, the, they, they, trans, me, they, make, they, they turn the RNA into DNA, first transcribe it, and they encode the primer, the cell barcode, and so when you ultimately do the RNA-seq, and you merge all these drops together, 
the barcodes that are common will tell you they came from the same cell. Now, um, let me just show you what the, so, so in, in, it's hard to see the cells, but you'll see there's a cell uh, right out here, and it's going to go by a little fast. So you see, you see the little cell right there, can somebody? And then there's the bead, and the drop is forming. So we have cells coming in here, gels coming in here, and the reaction mix, which contains the reverse transcriptase and the lysis conditions, all come together, and all this happens in the bead. And then later, when we've made the, the cDNA, we can then lyse all the things together and copy them all and evaluate it. I should say, in addition to the um, to the um, to the primer, there's also a unique identifier for each primer. Um, so, in addition to fact, you have, a, you have a primer that's common to every every um, uh, primer in a given bead that has the same sequence. Then, in every primer, there's also a unique sequence, and that's because you get these kind of uh, jackpotting things which really throw off the data where it'll copy uh, a, an RNA multiple times uh, and that'll, give, that'll throw it off. And with, by, you, by using the unique identifier, you can then deconvolute that down to the single initial copy. So that's, that's all the complexity of the barcode at the moment. And so, so then the, cell, the beads are coming in and if you're good, lucky, you'll be able to see some cells. I'll try to point one out. Uh, so, and I could, probably, I could talk about the unique feature here of our method, which is that, there's a cell, uh, it's right there. <laughs> so you, oh, another cell. <laughs> uh, uh, so what you're seeing is a lot of drops with no cells at all. That's not a problem, beads, and, uh, but, so, so I want to point a couple things about this. Uh, one is that, um, uh, lots of drops with beads and no cells. Uh, very few drops with cells but no beads. Um, we collect about 90% uh, of the cells are, are uh, going to be registered. Now, that, the reason we could do that actually is, is a feature that, we, that is unique to ours, which is that we're using these kind of compressible gels, and they're coming out absolutely at regular intervals. So otherwise, in order to avoid a situation where we would have two cells and one bead, you have to dilute the beads and the cells down there. So you have this Poisson distribution of, of, you know, of beads and cells coming through there, and you have to dilute them down way, way down. To do that, you actually lose efficiency. You'll get a lot of, you will get a lot of cells that have no beads. But because these gels are, are uh, compressible, they come out, this is something that was discovered several years ago, so it wasn't our discovery, but they come out at exactly regular intervals. So now we have, although the cells are coming out plus sign distributed, the bees are coming out exactly uniformly. And with that, we can get essentially all, uh, every cell reg registered. And that, when you're dealing with embryos or you're dealing with things, that, that could be important. If you're dealing with uh, isolating cells from bulk, some bulk tissue, which is homogeneous, are nearly homogeneous, and it really doesn't matter, but in, this, in many cases it will. Okay, what's, what's going on here? Okay, so again, we do the reverse transcriptase in the droplets. We do a library, we, library prep after we merge, after we um, lyse all the drops, we sequence it. Um, uh, we get the reads, we demultiplex de 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 the barcodes, we map them, we make an amplification correction uh, for based, in, based on those unique identifiers, and we have uh, genes here and cells here, and we, we make tables. I said this is really uh, advanced bookkeeping. So now here's the thing again that came as a surprise both to Steve McCarroll of Eve Gav's lab and, and Alain Klein and myself is that the data out of these uh, droplets is more. Um, precise than the bulk data. That some other reactions are more efficient than these small droplets. So we get really, really built up. For example, here are two experiments. Um, uh, one one, one uh, done with 2,500 ESLs, another done with 3,500 ESLs, and the correlation between them is 0.99. Uh, 
um, the, Coelia, the CV uh, with technical replicates is 0.98. And so the data is quite explicitly good. There are problems with inherent problems, which I'll show you in a moment, with single cell transcriptomic data that you ultimately do deal with variation, sampling variation. Uh, is, you know, if you, had a, if you have a, an RNA that's present in one copy per cell, that doesn't mean you're going to see one copy in, 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 that, in each sample. And it's worse than just if you copied everything. We only actually have an efficiency of 10%. We only copy 10% of the RNAs and DNA. And, and that's true for everybody. So it's a problem nobody has solved on bulk or in these single cell methods. So there's an opportunity, I think, to improve tenfold this thing, but we can never get away from the, the uh, Poisson variation in the sample. I mean, you know, it, it, you, can't, it, you can't say this cell is unique because it only has one RNA. Well, maybe it's unique, but maybe an hour later we would have that RNA present, and so you're, 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 you're only catching it at its moment. Um, so if you expect there are one gene at a time, what we see is this is again the the, the green, this is plotting the um, coefficient of variation versus the number of counts on a log scale, and uh, the the blue is just are the are most of the genes, and they're lying along this red line, which is the Poisson uh, error. But you can see in this case these are ES cells. I'll talk a little more about. You know, there are lots of things off this thing which are, whose, uh, whose uh, variation is much, much higher than uh, the, the, what you expect just by random variation. So what do we see? Well, I'm in a, again, this is where the conversation, the talk gets sort of a little light because we're, I'm not, and we're only beginning to analyze these things in some detail, but here is the ES cell population, and um, uh, here are the pl most of the cells are pluripotent cells. Uh, there are a few epidemic uh, cells. There's a population of cells which, uh, which expresses HSP90 and other heat shock proteins. We're not quite sure what that population is. It hadn't really been described before. Um, uh, we have some primitive endoderm cells already in that ES cell population. Uh, now, if we induce it to differentiate by lift withdrawal, uh, we still maintain a population of undifferentiated cells. And then we get, uh, un un again, epiblast cells and other type of endoderm cells and, and a bunch of other cell types that emerge over time. So it, is, it does give you a real um, f feeling for uh, the complexity of cell types that exist at, and even the purity of your population when you start with. This is a kind of wacky looking uh, dynamical <laughs> uh, uh, plot, which, uh, uh, so you know, before somebody has a seizure here looking at it, I wanna, um, <laughs> I wanna really get across. So what we, what we have here are a sampling of um, of uh, ES cells driven in the direction of motor neurons. And um, so in the first day, they're all clustered here. This is this, uh, this stochastic neighbor embedding method, which where the, no, nothing here, it's just a way of, of uh, clustering the data essentially, but not uh, using orthogonal clustering, but using a, a nearest neighbor clustering. Um, I can give a, a qualitative explanation better than that if people were interested, and then beyond that, I, I can't do it. But, anyways, but so you start here, um, and they're all pretty clustered here. And the next day, you see they move to, to a new uh, new dimensions here. They're quite different from that. There are a couple of cells, and then they move kind of uniformly into this type here. And eventually, after uh, about seven days, they uh, occupy three different groups which of uh, motor neurons, uh, they look like motor, they have all of the motor neuron characteristics. And what differentiates these three groups are anterior posterior positions in the embryo. So you can sort of see really the complexity of even motor neuron cell types in the embryo 
um, that appear in culture in this way. So, um, all right. So, so, but of course you, I'm sure, have been, been uh, waiting for the frog here. So, we can dissociate the cells, and um, when we do that, if we uh, put in DAPI, which is not so, which is not permeable. Um, except the soul is dead, we see that less than 1% of the blastomeres are dead uh, following dissociation and after two hours of room temperature, of course we're doing this in the cold and so it's, it it's, it's takes about an hour to, to run this experiment, it, it's still less than 5% of the cells are dead. So the preparation seems to, to work. Um, And here, it's going to look kind of chaotic because unlike ES cells going through the, the this is uh, uh, the, the cells in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the blastomers come at very different sizes. And we had to somehow, re we've reconfigured the, the dimensions of this thing to do a little, uh, to, um, to work with the xenopus embryos. But, uh, and there are a couple cases you'll see some small clumps and these clumps uh, resolve when the stuff goes through the rest of the tubing or the rest of the channels in the in this microfluidic chip. But I'll um, so again, so you see, it looks like lots of there's a big one going through, a small one's going through. It's a real family affair here. All right, so lots of different cells all going in ultimately to be. Um, counted and analyzed. Um, and then here's the other side of it when they're going in here. Now, of course, we have, you'll see that the, it's going back the other, the other direction. Now you can see the cells are quite big. They're comparable in size to the, uh, to the, um, the beads, actually. There's some, these are beads mostly here, but, uh, oh well. Yeah, there's the one also. So anyway, so that's, uh, so what kind of data comes out of the embryo from this? Well, we, that's how we collect them. They just pile up. As I say, they're stable. You see a cell in occasionally in these. And we just collect them and then we carry out the rest of the, all right. So in this case, I say, uh, the, the gel occupancy was 85%, the input density, the flow rates, the droplet size are three and a half nanoliters. And, we've, and here in this experiment, we, we, uh, we do 10,500 cells per hour. We can run it faster, but we're, that's what we've been doing. Okay. So what happens when, um, during development, well, we already see that uh, at the, at the um, at stage nine, uh, which is a time of gas relation, we see 50 variable genes. 10 and a half, it's gone up to 100. Um, stage 14, which is earliest neuralist stage, is about 200. And these about 500 variable genes later on. Now, this is an underestimate because we've only shallowly sequenced these things. And we have samples, we could do deeper sequences. These were really experiments just to. Um, prototype what we're trying to do. So we didn't want to waste money. So we could, you know, the, might, the numbers might be uh, um, 10 times that by the time we go to, to deeper sequencing. It's just, um, the <laughs> and um, how about uh, clustering these things? Well, uh, we have three non-trivial principal components at the beginning of gastrulation, going up to eight. At the end of gastrulation, beginning of neurulation is 16, and later stage 18 non-trivial ones, and these are uh, just a, a, some sense of what the, um, the uh, uh, complexity of the system is. And this, uh, and in these plots, we're, we're plotting um, uh, cells versus genes, and you can see at stage nine, um, there's, uh, things are not so crisp in terms of what, uh, cell types. They have a lot of variation, a lot of that variation may not be real, but by the time you get to stage 10 and a half, we get at the end of gastrulation, 
or stage 14, the beginning of neurulation, we're getting really very clear clusters here, which we think would correspond to specific cell types. And again, mostly what we're trying to do here is to see what we're getting, what we expect. Um, we can look, to, look, for, look at uh, positively uh, G-gene correlations. You know, these are gene-gene correlations. We can ask about these gene-gene correlations. And um, we can look at the, for an example here. This, this thing here is pot. And there are very few in C2s compared to the number of genes in the database. But if we look at ones where we there are in C2s, this is very high correlation. And you can see spatially these are highly correlated. So that's sort of when we, um, when we see negative correlation, well, we, they don't look very correlated. And by in C2s, and uh, the features are invisible at the whole embryo level. I mean, I'll just move on. Um, and I think we can, we can now begin to associate different new genes with specific uh, cell types. So for example, um, here uh, we have this, uh, this gene in uh, muscle differentiation, well known here, which correlates with this other gene, which is completely unknown. So we can begin to pull out uh, families of genes which may have some function for something we're interested in. Um, and as these occur, uh, we can look at variable gene expression and they begin to, to, to focus down. Just if we look at just the variable genes and we look at their correlations, we can begin to pull out little pockets of things that we might associate with being a specific cell type. And what we find is that uh, at the, in the early embryo, there are really two states that we can look at. At the at the gastrulation, there are five states. Uh, and the beginning of neurulation, 11, and 19 states is 23. And again, this is still not deeply refined data. Um, so this, the two states that I mentioned at stage nine, uh, shown as uh, red and, and blue, those um, correspond, the blue ones correspond to animal pole expression, and the uh, red ones correspond to vegetal pole expression. So they're more sp specific, um, re more cells specific to the animal pole than to the vegetal pole. Um, by stage 10 and a half, these clusters resolve into germ layers, and we can kind of associate these uh, with different, knowing the genes that are expressed, these different clusters which we can see just by informatically correspond to known germ layers, and then the germ layers in by stage 14 into all sorts of sub-classifications, and uh, eventually we can get also in the later stages interesting subclasses that correspond to specific cell types that are emerging in the embryo at this time. So, um, so what can I say? The, 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 you know, it's too early to really uh, give you any real le lessons from this uh, uh, single cell transcriptomics, but that the marker genes can reflect different populations at different time points of development. Um, we find that late expressed genes can be deployed across multiple lineages perhaps related to some common use of the target. So it's not, it's gonna be very interesting to see these genes that come up that are expressed everywhere about the same time. And um, for every cell state, there are quite a large number of specific genes of which little is not, nothing is known about their function. Um, it's interesting, the mesenderm, the derm splits into mesoderm and endoderm through refinement of initially promiscuous expression. Um, for those of us who talked over lunch, this is, um, uh, this is kind of an uh, indication that these mesenderm cells were broadly expressing the genes present ultimately in the endoderm and mesoderm. And then uh, a little bit later, at stage 10 and a half, uh, these are uh, uh, associated with different cell types, not just smeared up over a common cell type. And so that, that may be a, a strategy of differentiation where you make a, 
a kind of uh, indifferent type of cell type, which then uh, spe spe gets specified into two or more cell types. Um, and I think the only thing I want to point out here is uh, the uh, presence of uh, the nano-specific cells. You, a very s s limited, a very small number of cells, which are the red ones, these two cells here, uh, and that one cell by stage 14 is the only nano-positive cell, which is specifying the, uh, the germline. So you can, get, uh, you can get information about even a single cell in an embryo that will, will show up even, you know, if, with this level of expression in bulk would be completely lost, but that one little cell here, which is present here, uh, is in fact the primitive, um, there would be probably more than one cell because we only looked at probably 20% of the cells in the embryo in this case. Um, so there are many open questions that I think can be better defined now by such methods. Uh, I'm particularly interested if we can find evidence for dynamic interconversions among cell types before they're actually specified. Um, and this will ultimately have to be proven by other means, but I think we can, we, we showed indication of, the, un, of that in the ES cell, in the epiblast intercell mass-like cell in the ES cell states that looked where you had all sorts of intermediates uh, in individual cells. And that suggests that these things are interconverting. There's other explanations, but I think that's the most reasonable one. We want to know, are there multiple paths, paths to cell specification that might emerge? How many cell types are there that might emerge? Is the concept of cell type expressible in a very defined <laughs> list of genes? I think when we get whole transcriptomes, we'll have better ways of saying things there. Is differentiation an instructive or selective process? I don't have time to go into that question, my favorite one. Uh, can we use our ability to convert RNA expression to protein expression and employ correlations of expression to reverse engineer developmental pathways? That's maybe a, uh, a long-term view. Um, so I want to you know, thank people from uh, uh, Alain Klein's new lab um, uh, and uh, including James Briggs, who shared between our two labs. And David Waits was the engineer at uh, Harvard Applied Physics, who uh, helped develop the, um, tr the, the droplet microfluidic systems that most people use, including both, the, both papers that were published simultaneously in cell that I pointed out. I'll give you a little bit more of a picture of the people who were principally responsible. Alain Klein, who worked out uh, a lot of the, the, essentially all the mechanics and details, but also provided very important bioinformatic information and, and analysis, uh, statistical analysis, which was very helpful. And Leon Peshkin, who is a mathematician or, and a computer scientist, who also added some new features that had to be used for single cell analysis that don't uh, come up in bulk methods. James Briggs, who's a graduate student, has, has uh, pioneered the development of the Xenopus single cell transcriptomics, and Martin Voor, who uh, developed a lot of these new methods in mass spectrometry, which both computational and principally also um, new chemical methods that I think have broader applicability than obviously what we talked about. So I think I ran over, but sorry, thank you. <laughs>